chapter 5. We're going to be looking at one verse this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 21. This is the next verse in our lineup as we've been going together as a church through 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to read verse number 21 together. I'd invite you to please stand with me as we honor God's word by reading verse number 21. The Bible says this, For our sake, now everything that we're about to continue to say, I want you to remember that. It says, For our sake, He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. I'm going to read it one more time. For our sake He made Him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Now let's go to the Lord and ask for His help. Lord, as we come together as a church here this morning, remind us of what took place not too long ago. Not too long ago, we gathered together as a church for Easter morning, and now here we are, celebrating and remembering Pentecost, the day by which you poured out your Spirit upon the church. And remind us here this morning that as we go forward and as we read and as we study together, that nothing can be done without your Spirit. Lord, the... The preaching of your word is nullified without the Spirit. But much more than that, there's no way we can understand what verse number 21 says without your Spirit. So Lord, much more than anything else, we're asking for your Spirit to come and to allow us to understand this passage and to apply this passage and that your Spirit would draw and would save people that are here this morning that are unconverted. We ask that Christ will be glorified in this service through everything that is said and done, but also the application that, that as we apply this passage to our life, as, as people hear this message and, and are saved, that ultimately it wouldn't bring glory to Raymond Baptist Church, but it would bring glory to you. Uh, Lord, help us now, as Forrest prayed a few minutes ago, I, I pray that there would be nothing that would draw our affections away, nothing that would draw our attention away from your word and what you're trying to teach us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church family, you can be seated. In 1347, which has been a few years ago, right? In 1347, a Mongol army decided that they were going to invade a particular region, the region that we now know as modern-day Ukraine. And one of their tactics for invading this, this city was to take victims of the bubonic plague. So they were eat up with sickness, and they had died. They took those bodies, and they... It sounds pretty cool, right? They took those bodies and catapulted them over the city walls into the city. You know what the people did inside the city walls? They were scared to death. There's bodies flying over the wall. So they fled into Italy. But the bad news is, the bacteria from those bodies, they took with them as they fled. Now over the course of the next three years, this, I guess we could call it a plague, spread all throughout Europe in what we now know as the Black Death. It estimated that this particular plague infected over 20 million people and killed, the population then, between one-third and one-half of Europe's population. That's a lot of people. This is a huge plague that took place. And there were, in the centuries that followed, outbreaks of this plague over time. And eventually it was kind of snuffed out in the 20th century with the uh, discovery of antibiotics. It was a pretty bad plague. But there's also been other plagues and sicknesses all throughout history. In 1918 and 1919, we've seen uh, the influenza epidemic that hit. It estimated in that time, between 30 and 50 million people were infected. <coughs> Pretty bad epidemic. There have been more diseases. Uh, malaria, yellow fever, 
AIDS, again, fill in your blank, but, but there's been all kinds of epidemics and plagues all throughout human history. But there's one plague that is so much more widespread. It didn't just affect a continent, it didn't just affect a people group. This plague that I'm about to tell you about has infected all people. Every person that's ever lived with a 100% fatality. Its cause is not only physical death, this particular plague also causes spiritual death. What's the name of the plague that I'm talking to you guys about here this morning? It's the plague of sin. The Bible tells us that every single person, apart from Christ, has been infected with this plague. In fact, they've, they've contracted this disease, this plague, ever since they were born. The Bible tells us in Psalm chapter 51, verse number 5, let me just read it to you. It says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in, my, and in sin my mother conceived me. We are sinners. We have this disease from birth. It's not like a kid gets old enough and learns how to sin. In fact, they were, it, was, it was in their DNA. Their DNA has been affected by sin. Psalm 58, verse number 3, it goes on to say, The wicked are estranged from birth. From the womb. These who speak lies go astray from birth. Not only are we sinners, not only do we have this disease ever since we were born, ever since we were conceived, we're not sinners not only by birth, but we're also sinners by profession. It's our job. It's what we do. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 3, verse number 10, There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now what's the outcome for those who have the, uh, <laughs> the sin plague? Those that have been infected. The Bible tells us the, the outcome is death. This is pretty interesting. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse number 20 plainly says, The person who sins will die. Pretty cut and dry, right? The person who sins will die. Well, we just explained every person has sinned, therefore all will die. You know, I, I, I did a little study. I wanted to make sure I didn't overlook anybody. So I went back to the first man. Genesis chapter 5, verse number 5. talks about Adam. You know how long he lived? The Bible tells us he lived 930 years. Remember, Adam sinned as well. You know what the Bible goes on to say? He lived 930 years and he died. I started looking at his genealogy. This was the case for all his ancestors that followed him. From Adam to today, every person that's ever been born has sinned, and therefore every person has died. That's the diagnosis or the prognosis in the physical realm, but it's also the case in the spiritual realm as well. There are spiritual consequences because we've sinned. We've seen physical, but what about spiritual? What are the consequences because we've sinned? Well, number one, the first consequences is that we're separated from God in this life. Because we've sinned, there's now a great chasm between sinful man and the holy God, and there's no way we could ever build a bridge in order to get over. That's the first consequence. The second consequence is there's punishment in hell with no hope of relief for those who have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You're saying, man, what a homecoming message. Well, I've already explained some pretty bad news that you're sick, you've contracted a disease, and you're going to die. How about some good news? Well, the good news tells us that there is a cure. There is only one cure for this sin and for all those infected by the sin epidemic. God provided what we call a remedy for sin. The sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, that's enough for us to celebrate the rest of the service. That we were sick and there is a cure. I guarantee you if you had seen the oncologist this last week and someone had to come into church and said, Hey, so and so, they've just found a cure for what, you're, what you've contracted. I guarantee you, you would have went to your Sunday school class, 
to everybody in church, just celebrating the news that you now have hope. Why is it then, when we share the good news about Jesus Christ, that now we have hope, not only in this life, but in the life to come, we sit still and we remain silent? It's because our heart and our affections aren't, we don't think about those things. We're so preoccupied, that isn't even a word, we're so preoccupied with the present. What we're learning about this morning here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we see the cure, but we see how that cure was made possible. In fact, reviewing two weeks ago, look in verse number 18. This tells us how this cure is made possible. This is chapter 5, verse 18. It says, all this is from God. A great reminder, right? The cure is made possible by Him. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to Himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ. God making His appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Now, in the, next few, in the next verse, we're going to see how this relationship between a holy God and a sinful man can be restored. A lost sinner, which brings us to some questions that we're going to answer. How can someone like myself, who deserves no mercy, find mercy? Someone who who fails as a pastor, who fails as a father, who fails as a husband. How can someone like that find mercy? Another question. How can God, who doesn't let sin slide, who is perfectly just, how can someone like that give grace? Well, in one short verse that we just read, it answers that question. This is only five words in the original Greek. Excuse me, 15 words in the original Greek that give us hope. It articulates the most glorious truth in Scripture, how sinful man can have a relationship with Holy God. Let's look at it. Notice number one, the sponsor. Look at verse 21 again. It says, for our sake, he made. Now We need to emphasize that. Who is the he in verse number 21? It says, He made. Well, in order to understand verse 21, we've got to understand the previous verses. We can't just take this out of context. Verse number 20 tells us that it's God the Father. It says, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making His appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ be reconciled to God. What we need to understand is that reconciliation between holy God and sinful man, that wasn't something that man come up with. This was all part of God's plan. Now, what do I mean by that? God's the one who initiated this plan, but He's also the one who applied this plan. You see, we can't just sit down. Well, I, I can't even give ourselves that credit. Do you understand who we are apart from the Holy Spirit's work in our life? We're dead. Have you, ever, have you ever been around a dead person? What can they do? Absolutely nothing. But, but much more than that, we're not just dead, we're rotting. And, and, and we're just wallowing around in filth and nasty. That's the unregenerate man. That's the man apart from Christ. We're, we're wallowing in the nastiness of this world. And we're taking pleasure in the filth. That's where we were. Do you think someone who is dead can come up with a plan to save themselves? To make their position better? No. I explained this to a group of people last week up in Louisville at a funeral. Uh, children were sitting around, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. In fact, there were children everywhere. 
which is great to see at a funeral. That's a legacy, right? But all these babies were running around, and I was trying to explain to that family that their mom did not get to spend an eternity with Christ because she was a good mom, because she was a member of a local church, or that she'd been baptized. And so I shared with them a passage of Scripture that comes from Isaiah 64, verse number 6, which says this, All our righteousness are like a polluted garment. We, are, we all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. I explained to them, with all those children around, I explained, I said, you know, your mom probably changed a lot of diapers in her day. She could probably have changed them in her sleep. I said, all the good things that we do in this life are like taking a, a filled diaper. You've been there, I know. A nasty, dirty diaper and presenting that before holy God and say, hey, will you let me in? No. There's nothing that we can do in order to earn salvation. Only God could design a way for sin to be paid for and a way to propitiate His wrath, to turn away and to appease His holy wrath. He designed a plan in which the second person in the Trinity would come. Philippians tells us this. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 8. Talking about Christ. It says, Being found in the appearance as a man, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. God knew what it would take to rescue His people. God knew what it would take to appease His wrath, to make a nasty people acceptable in His sight. You see, so vast and so uncomprehensible is God's plan, there's no way man could come up with it, a way to earn salvation. In fact, I would submit to you that every other religion that talks about man doing something, like, I don't want to, let me divert our thoughts for just a second. When we think about God's plan for us, it is different than every other religion in the world in that this plan emphasizes God's love. Romans chapter 5, verse number 8. God demonstrated His own love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. All the false gods that we learn about in world religions, we, we see them as being either angry or indifferent. There's people that are sacrificing babies to these gods or doing this and doing that because these false gods are angry. Or you see Baal in, in the Old Testament who is just indifferent. In fact, Elijah even asked the question, where is your God? Is he relieving himself? But there's something different about God's plan. In and that, he isn't hostile towards us. He, he cares for us. He's a loving Savior by nature. He doesn't need to be appeased by human beings. In fact, He took it upon Himself to provide a way and to come at the sacrifice of His Son. Christ's sacrifice for the penalty of our sins met the demands of God. Now He offers us forgiveness freely. Listen to this, and then we'll move on to our second point. Isaiah 55, verse number 1, says, Come, everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters, he who has no money. Come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. So when we read this verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he made, understand this is God's plan. This isn't something that man come up with. He is the sponsor. Number two, notice the substitute. Let's keep reading. It says, for our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin. Now, let's step back for just a second. There is only one who knew no sin. There's only one person that's ever walked this earth who knew no sin, who never did anything wrong, who perfectly obeyed his parents, who perfectly obeyed his heavenly father, who responded correctly to every single temptation that come his way. That man was Jesus Christ. There was only one who is qualified to bear the wrath of God. Now, let's talk about this substitute, the one who did die. Now, 
The qualifications of this substitute is that he would have to be a man in order to die for a man. But he would also have to be God. Why? Because only God is sinless. This narrows us down to only one substitute, only one choice, and that was the God-man, Jesus Christ. So this is exactly what happened. This substitute came. The second person of the Trinity came. He became a man. He had a human mother, but not a human father. We know this. Have you ever thought about that for just a second? Nowhere in Scripture is Joseph referred to Christ's father. Nowhere. Nowhere can you find that in in Scripture. Why? Because Christ was conceived of the Holy Spirit. He was fully God and yet fully man. He was a perfect one for a sacrifice. He was sinless. Completely sinless. In fact, people that spent time around him testified to the fact. It doesn't take long to spend... or. I mean, just take a trip to Brandenburg with somebody, and you'll see they're sinners. Well, the people that spent years and years around Christ, they testified that he was sinless. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 5. This is someone testifying. In him there is no sin. The most powerful testimony that Christ was sinless came from his heavenly Father. Listen to what he said. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. A holy God looks on the life of His Son and He sees it as completely perfect and He's pleased and He presents Christ as His holy substitute. Now, let's look at verse 21 again. For our sake He made Him to be sin. There are a lot of people that fall off the wagon when they read this. I want you to understand when the Bible says that He made Him to be sin, it doesn't mean that Christ became a sinner. That's not what what Scripture's saying. In fact, if you're still awake, I hope you are, it'd be bad to get called out, wouldn't it? That would be embarrassing. I'm just waiting until everybody wakes up. All right, I think everybody's awake now. Take your Bible and turn with me to Isaiah 53. I will know who woke up because they will be the ones who are grumpy at the meal after church. Isaiah 53, verse number 4. This describes the only sense in which Christ could be made sin. Isaiah 53, verse number 4. The Bible says this, Surely He has borne... Whose griefs? Our griefs. And carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem Him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Now, wait a second. This clarifies in verse number 5. It says, But he was pierced not for his transgressions, but for our our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. With his wounds we are healed. We ha- and Verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, what? Not Christ's iniquities, but the iniquities of us all. He was made sin not because He had sinned, but because we had. We are the ones that done wrong. What's this mean? The Father treated Christ as if He was a sinner, charging Him with the sins for everyone who would choose to believe in His Son. That's what took place. And at the moment, Matthew 27, verse number 46, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that very moment. Here is Christ, who was personally pure, never sinned, but He became forensically guilty. God credits believers' sins to Christ's account. So think of everything that you've ever done. I'm talking to the believers in here. Everything that you've ever done, every, every wrong thought, every wrong motive, every single sin, and that was taken and it was put in Christ's account. 
Now, everything that Christ has done completely perfectly, completely listened to his parents, in everything, he was perfect. That righteousness is then taken and placed into our account. It's a beautiful exchange. You see, the entire human race is cursed. And there's nothing we can do to lift that curse. There's only one way we can be reconciled to God. Listen to this. This is Galatians 3. It says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Listen, just by sinning one time, by breaking the law once, we're condemned to go to hell. But the Bible says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, everyone curses everyone who hangs on a tree. If Christ hadn't died, folks, listen to me, there's no way we could have a relationship with the Holy God. We've talked this morning about the sponsor. We've talked about the substitute. Now let's notice number three, the believers as beneficiaries. What does that mean? We'll explain it here in just a second. Look at verse 21. The very first part says, for our sake. Why did he do all this? It says, for our sake. Who's he referring to? Well, everyone. Now wait a second. For our sake. We've got to go back and look at the context. Look back at verse number 20. It says, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. There's an antecedent. What that means is that in verse 21, it's looking back to the antecedent, which is the ambassadors of Christ. Who did Christ die for? We go back to verse 18. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us. Christ's death on the cross, listen to me folks, Christ's death on the cross was efficacious. It was productive for those who would believe in Him. Christ died for all who would believe in Him. And because we believe in Him, because we trust solely in what God has done through His Son, provided the substitute, we confess our sins and we turn to Him as a sole means of salvation, we become beneficiaries. Years and years ago, which is only like three years ago, uh, a friend encouraged me with just some helpful advice. He says, Brother Travis, do you have life insurance? What? Like, I don't, even, I don't even know if we got bottles clean in the sink at this point. All these babies, and then you're asking me about life insurance. Well, turns out I didn't have life insurance. And so uh, I began the process of trying to figure out, to make a long story short, they sent me a paper, and they, I had to give blood or whatever. And then underneath, there was what was called beneficiaries. So if I croak out, get hit by a car, whatever happens, you know, this is what it is. My policy will go to beneficiaries, Miss Emily, and the rest of the herd. Um, in the occasion of my death, others would, I looked up the word beneficiaries, they are the ones who would receive money or other benefits from what we call the benefactor. Now, what's all this have to do with us? Because Christ died on the cross, those who choose to believe in Him become beneficiaries from the benefactor. We can enjoy the benefits of the substitutionary death of Christ. Now let's talk about those benefits. Last point this morning. I know you guys smell the chicken. It smells great. But we need to finish. The benefit, verse number 21. Why? It says, For our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin. Why? The Bible says, So that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. The benefit of placing our trust in Him is that we become righteous before God. 
the benefit of our sins being placed on Christ, Christ's righteousness being placed on us, it clearly says in verse number 21, so that we might become the righteousness of God. Listen to how this is described in Philippians chapter 3, verse number 9. It says, Believers are found in Him, not having a righteousness of their own, derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Since Jesus has paid the demands for God's justice, God no longer holds that against those who trust in Him. Psalm 32, verse number 1. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Psalm 30, verse number 3. says, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there's forgiveness with you that you may be feared. The question for us this morning and the question for those that are still awake is how? How can we receive the righteousness of God? By faith. By faith in the complete forgiveness provided by Christ. Listen to what the Bible says. Romans 3 verse number 22. The righteousness of God comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who will believe. Romans 3.28 For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. One more verse that I want to include. Turn with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. How can we receive the righteousness of God Romans 10, verse 9, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. You see, what takes place is when a man or a woman or a boy or a little girl acknowledges their sin. You know, since we're sinners from birth, we, have, we don't know exactly what age God will come and reveal the sin to a child or to a man or to a woman. We don't, we don't know when that's going to take place. But when it does, when God awakens that dead, rotten heart of a little boy or an old man or like last week, a woman 70 days ago who's dying, when God convicts that person of their sin... And when they affirm Christ as Lord and solely trust in His work on their behalf, when that takes place, God credits His righteousness to their account and they're saved. Conviction by the Holy Spirit, a turning and a confessing of sin, an acknowledgement of Christ as Lord and trusting in His finished work. That's how we receive the righteousness of God. I want you to remember this. On the cross, God treated Jesus as if He lived our lives full of sin. In order to that, God could treat us as if we had lived Christ's life of pure holiness. This is, I'm going to lay in the plane. This is the only cure, the only one for the sin plague that we have. The only one. You're sick. There's only one way. And I'll admit, the world offers all kinds of, we'll call them salves. Is that how you say that word, Emily? Salves for your problem. But what happens many times is the solution the world offers actually adds to our sin problem. It makes things worse. I heard about a girl one time who uh, had some sort of worm growing in her like what do you call it, tapeworm or something? And she would never go to the doctor, but one of her family members gave her some sort of treatment. I don't know what it was, some sort of cream. But it was actually, over time, feeding that worm in her body is nasty. Here's the point. That's what the world, that's what the world does. They know there's a problem, and they try to self-treat the problem. 
when they just need to go to the great physician who's already got the cure. He just needs them to ask. You see, we'll share another story real quick. No sign, I heard that. Years ago, I used to have like the worst migraine headaches. Like bad, like it just shut me down. Couldn't drive, couldn't work, couldn't do nothing. And so, went to the doctor and they prescribed a medication. Forget what the name of it was, but I no longer take it. But I would take that medicine and it would, it would alleviate some of the effects of that migraine. Well, I can remember going to the pharmacy saying, hey, I, want, I need to get some more of this, I think it's called super triptane or something. I need to get some more of this, I've run out. Well, what had happened is I'd waited too long. You had to get this prescription filled beyond, before a certain point or the prescription expired. Well, there's consequences because I didn't go. I had to face the full effects. The reason why I share this story with you is you've heard about the cure, and yet there will still be people, maybe in this room this morning, who know there's a cure, they know they're sick, yet they won't go to the divine pharmacist and take and, and receive what he's provided for them. It's the only cure. Christ is the only cure. I can't make you take the medicine. I can only encourage you to take it. The question this morning is, have you received and are you trusting in Christ alone for salvation? If you're not, well, we know the consequences for when we're sick and we don't take the necessary medicine. Death. Death physically and death spiritually. I'd invite you here in just a second. We're going to stand our feet. And if you're here this morning and You've never trusted Christ and Christ alone as your Lord and Savior. And I'm not talking about, everybody stop packing up for just a second. I'm not talking about this surface level Christianity where you come up here and say, Brother Travis, blah, blah, blah. And then, and then you just say some empty words and then you continue living your life as though nothing ever happened. I'm talking about those that will come and say, I'm a dead man. And I need to be made alive in Christ. And when he does that, you spend the rest of your life serving him because it's no longer your life that you're living. Galatians 2.20 tells us this. For I've been crucified with Christ. For it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live here in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. If you're here this morning and you've never done that, you're ready to declare spiritual bankruptcy, your account is overdrawn, and you're ready for God to credit cross-righteousness to your account, it should be a great morning to do that. Let me pray for you. Lord, we come to this moment at the conclusion of the service that we pray that your word went forward unhindered and unaltered. Lord, I do pray that those that are here that are willing to listen would not be trusting in human means, a good life, showing up to church this morning, thinking they're changing themselves positionally when only Christ can do that. Lord, I do pray that folks would settle that matter in their hearts and that they would trust in you. Lord, this is your invitation, whatever you desire. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.